Okay, so there will be three parts uh, today. Uh, one will be this talk that I will give this morning, which will be about, uh, as I said, the modeling dialogue as a sequential decision-making problem. And uh, I will explain how uh, theoretically you can uh, optimize this kind of sequential decision-making problem. Then in the second part this afternoon, Milica will talk about how to do this in practice. That means how do we scale up the algorithms and how to uh, represent uh, dialogue in this framework. And in the third part, uh, we will have a practical session uh, where we will have the opportunity to use real dialogue data and try to uh, manipulate this data and cast it into this framework of uh, statistical modeling of dialogue system. So first of all, I want to, to thank people who worked with me on all the things I will uh, explain today. So uh, I had colleagues and uh, former students. Uh, Mathieu Geist who was a colleague of mine when I was working previously at Superdeck in France. Uh, Sentil who is here in the room. Uh, but also Lucie, Leila, Edouard and Bilal who were uh, PhD students of mine and worked on, this, on these topics with me. And of course I thank Yanis to invite me here and uh, have a wonderful week. <laughs> Thanks, Lynn. Uh, so yeah, so let's start about our uh, problem of spoken dialogue systems. So first, what is a spoken dialogue system? A spoken dialogue system is actually a, a, a system uh, that you interact with through speech. So the idea is that all the inter you, you want to have interaction with the machine, and you will only use speech. So you speak to the machine, and the machine will speak to you, and that's the only model modality that you will use to interact with the machine. Uh, so the machine, according to some computation and some knowledge it has, will answer you smartly, you expect, uh, and will understand what you say. And according to uh, the task it has to uh, achieve, then uh, it will try to build a dialogue with you. So uh, it will be a long-term interaction with the machine. Well, when I say long-term, it can be a few minutes or a few hours or whatever, but not just a one-shot uh, dialogue, well, one-shot interaction. It's not that you just give some input, uh, speech input, you receive a speech input and that's it. No, a dialogue is more elaborate. You have to uh, interact for a while with the machine to build a dialogue over time with it. And so there are different types of dialogue systems in, uh, in, in the, that you can find uh, around. And I will focus on one type of dialogue system, which, has, which are the dialogue system that we call goal directed. So they try to achieve some specific task to, to provide you some specific, specific information. It's not about chatting with the machine about anything else that you want to chat with, the, with some body or whatever. It's, a, it's really that you want to achieve some task and you want to do it through a dialogue with the machine. So it's, for example, hotlines or uh, information services, like you want to have information about the, the weather uh, for the next week and things like that. So you call a machine to get information about, yeah, as I said, either the, the, the weather or uh, uh, train schedules and things like that. So you, you have a really uh, focused application. Uh, and uh, so it's, we are, I'm not talking about uh, other fancy applications you could imagine about chatting with a uh, avatar or things like that. So what is the problem with dialogue systems? Actually, uh, you probably have already interacted with dialogue systems uh, in the past because when you, most of the uh, telecom operators, for example, would automize some part of uh, the, their uh, hotlines. For example, they would try to identify what is the problem you, are, you want to solve before uh, passing some specialists of your problem. For example, uh, you have your modem is not working, so you will call some system and you'll tell that you want to talk about problems about modems. It will recognize that you have problems about models and probably uh, send uh, your call to some specialist about modems. And what will uh, those people do? Usually they will follow some decision tree. They will ask you specific questions to know what is your problem, etc., and then they will figure out that you actually have a very common problem. And usually uh, all this can actually be automatized. I mean, there is no 
uh, usually no need of interacting with a real human because your problem is really simple. And it's the same if you want to uh, book a train ticket. Uh, you actually don't have very elaborate problems. You want just to go from one place to another at a specific time on a specific day. So you call some human, and this human will always ask the same questions. So the idea of token dialogue system is to automatize these uh, uh, very simple dialogues. And it's, the idea is that you want to process a maximum of these interactions automatically, and you want to avoid bad experiences uh, from the user. So you also probably have experienced some problems when interacting with a machine. It doesn't recognize correctly what you say. It always asks to confirm what you say, etc. So that's not today. It's not very natural, and you may have some uh, very bad experience with machines. So what we want to do is to avoid this. And to avoid this, actually, we, are we, we, we need to understand that building a, style, a dialogue system is not just about putting speech recognition together with text-to-speech synthesis. It's, a it's about building a real interaction over time with, with a human. And building this, this interaction over time with, uh, with a human means that you, have, you need, actually, to have a strategy on how to interact with the, machine, with, with the, with the human. So it's, uh, if you want to build such uh, a system by hand, if you want to build a dialogue system by hand, you need to uh, list all the situations in which the user can be during the dialogue and cast, like, match some decision about this situation uh, to what uh, to decisions uh, the dialogue, should, dialogue system should uh, take. So it, actually, you you really have to uh, yeah, have a list of all the, the, the possible contexts in which the dialogue system and the user can be and uh, provide decisions to the system. So that's very, actually very difficult to do, especially because the system, a dialogue system is that kind of system. I, I'm not, Melissa will talk a bit more about all, all, all this uh, this afternoon, but I just wanted to say that a dialogue system is actually a, a system through which you interact with a machine uh, by uh, well, some channels, and the channel is noisy. So actually, the channel you use to talk to a machine is actually composed of speech recognition, speech understanding, also text-to-speech. And this, all this is noisy because all these, all these systems are not perfect. You know, speech recognition doesn't work 100%. Speech understanding doesn't work 100%. And so all these modules that you are using, all these modules that uh, you are implicitly using when you talk to a machine, produce some noisy observation that you actually have to use to decide what to say to the user according to what you perceived from the speech, the spoken input of the user. And so, so there are two key components of a dialogue system that will be the focus of this, uh, uh, of the, the two talks today. So there is one which is a task model that will transform the input in some understandable stuff, understandable material for the machine. And a dialogue manager, which is actually a module that decides what, according to this representation of what you say, decide what to say to the user, what to reply to the user. So this will be the, the topic of the talk of uh, Melissa this afternoon, and uh, this will be more the topic of this talk this uh, morning. So you need to uh, take into account the fact that you are, when you build such a system that takes decisions, you need to take into account that you have a user speaking to a machine through a noisy channel and so this is actually uh, difficult to, hand, to handle in decision making. So more specifically, what is the dialogue manage management uh, system doing? It's actually the, let's say, the brain of the system. It actually decides what to do, uh, what to say, what to ask, and when to say things to the user. So it's uh, also responsible for uh, accomplishing the task of the dialogue system. So of course, you, when you decide what to say to a user, it's according to the task you are trying to achieve. If you are 
if you are trying to sell a, a train ticket, for example, for some place, then the dialogue should be conducted by the machine so that at the end you get a train ticket from the machine. So it has to take complex inputs. ASR, not the error, so. Uh, it has to take complex input as uh, complex data as input. It has to determine what to say and what to, uh, to, to ask to the user and when to say it. It is also responsible for reco rec recovering from errors. So if the system didn't understand correctly what you said, you cannot go on with the dialogue like this. You need to recover uh, from errors and you need to uh, yeah, try to get confirmations or try to get corrections from the, the user about the information you didn't understand. So this is a very, uh, a very big problem in dialogue systems because when you, when you go on with a dialogue with some machine and it did a, didn't understand from the beginning what you asked and it goes on and goes on asking you questions about something that it didn't understand at the beginning, it's very difficult to come back at the beginning from uh, to, to start again and or to recover from these kinds of, kinds of errors. So the inputs are complex and the outputs are also complex because there are decisions which are uh, concepts or semantic representation of what, of what you want to say to, uh, to the user. As, uh, as I said, so after the, the dialogue manager did a decision, then it has to go through some natural language generation. So it, it outputs some con some concepts, you go through natural language generation to transform this into text and then from text to speech with TTS. So let's take an example of a dialogue so that you better understand how it, how it works. Uh, so here, here you have a, a dialogue about some task that will probably come, uh, it will come again in a, during the presentation. So I will often come back to this kind of example of, uh, of a dialogue task. So the task is uh, you want to find some restaurant into a city and you actually have three different features that you want to uh, specify to the machine so that it gets you the correct restaurant that you want. So the three different information you want to provide to the, the machine are the, the location, the price range, and the type of cuisine you want in the restaurant. So we interact with the machine and the machine should give you the, the name and the address of some restaurants that, is, uh, that matches your uh, requirements. So of course the dialogue will always start with some greeting. So this column is actually some internal representation of the dialogue that will be used by the system to take decisions about what to say next. And this is actually what the, the user and the system will really uh, say. So at the beginning, the, the dialogue management will decide to greet the user. So it will ask, what can I do for you? How may I help you? Then the user say, well, I don't really know. Um, <clears throat> so you get a, the, the dialogue manager knows that the user said, well, well, one thing that I forgot to say is that I will consider here in this, this example that the, the machine understands perfectly what, you, what the user said, which is actually, actually a very uh, ideal situation. But just to make it simple, uh, I, I, I use it like this. So uh, because the dialogue manager didn't get any information from the human at that point, it asks which location uh, the, the, the user wants to find in which location the user wants to find some restaurant. So this is actually ask a location. It's the, the way of representing internally. There are many ways of representing internally the, 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 um, the information, but this is some convenient way that we often use uh, in this talk. So uh, this translates into, okay, do you have any favorite uh, information? And then the, the user will say, well, I'd like an Italian restaurant by the river. So it actually provides two information, the type of cuisine and the, and the location. So it comes to the machine that it gets uh, actually two information from uh, the user, and then the dialogue goes on and goes on. And then after the, user, after the system got all the information, it provides the name of a restaurant to the user, the user is happy, and the dialogue concludes. Everything was uh, perfect, the, the system understood perfectly. It decided to provide information at the right time. It, did, it did, decided to ask 
for missing information here because it didn't get the information from the user before. So there are different decisions by the, di the dialogue manager which are taken according to the information it got from the user during time. So it got two information here. It, it missed the price range. It asked for one from for the, for the price range, then found some restaurant corresponding, and then uh, concluded the dialogue. So what we want is to actually learn this, the, these decisions made by the dialogue manager automatically so that it can be transferred from task to task, it can be learned from data, uh, et cetera. But why is, what, why is it so difficult to do this? Why is it difficult to learn uh, uh, the dialogue strategy? It's actually because you are interacting with a human. And interacting with a human makes some you know, troubles arising. So first, uh, a human is non-deterministic. Non uh, so if you ask a question to a human, in the same situation, the same human, but a different day will answer you differently. So I mean, uh, a different user will, ask, uh, will actually uh, answer differently to the same question. So actually, you cannot expect to get the same answer to the same question in different situations or in the same situation, but with different users, et cetera. So this, this is very hard to model, because if you wanted to model human, you would, you would need some model of human cognition and all speech is processed by the brain, et cetera, and all, all the personality of people would uh, modify the way they, they talk to a machine, et cetera. So this is very difficult to model, so we should avoid making models of users, of humans. There is also a problem of risk management. So it's not really a, a physical problem when you interact through speech. It's okay. You, you, you really don't risk a lot. But you, can, you, you actually risk to annoy the user or to, pro, to give a bad experience to the user when, when, when it interacts with the machine. So you should try to avoid risks uh, because the, the user can just hang off because he's set up talking to a machine. So that's, that's a risk that you have to manage. There is also a problem of non-stationarity. So non-stationarity is that, as I said, uh, a you, even if it's probabilistic, so even if uh, a human is probabilistic and has different probabilities of saying something, answering something to some question, these probabilities can change over time. Because actually, you get experience with the system, for example. You call, this, this is the third time you call the system to get the restaurant uh, information. And so you know how this system works. So you will change the way you interact with the machine over time because you know, you better know the, the, the system know than you knew it uh, three, week, three weeks before, for example. And this makes the probability of answering uh, something to the machine changing with time. So this something also very difficult to handle usually, is the, uh, at least by humans. If, if you actually uh, try to write uh, and craft a dialogue strategy uh, by human experts, this non-stationarity will, ve will be very difficult to handle because then you, you have to think about how the user will modify his behavior with time. That's, that's very difficult to do. And then there is also this problem of uncertainty in observations. So when you observe the human activity through speech, you actually do that through speech recognition and speech uh, understanding. And this is actually, you know, you don't, observe directly the mind of the, the, the people. You don't really know what they want. You actually only have observations through speech. Speech is already noisy. You, you, you usually don't even tell what you really think, or what you really mean uh, by speech, but it's been translated into some uh, internal representation by automatic systems, and this is actually noisy and makes your observation of what the user wants uncertain. So you have to deal with all these things when you uh, interact with people. So you have to handle the stochastic user behavior. You have also to handle the, 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 the fact that the user goal can change during the, the, the dialogue. <coughs> you, for example, you actually figure out that there is no cheap Italian by a river, so you may actually change your mind and go for an Italian restaurant through the train station, uh, close to the train station, because it's there there is a cheap one. So you change your goal with, with, with time. Uh, so there is the uncertainty due to imperfect uh, proce uh, inputs processing. Uh, you have the, the, the fact that 
you don't you, you want to, the the user to have a good experience with the machine, and this is very you know it's easy to say, but it's very hard to model. What is a good experience? What is a bad experience? So it's very hard to model this uh, before you interact with the machine. Actually, you can you can know after interacting that it was bad, but you cannot tell in advance that it will be bad. That's that's difficult. So as I said, user expertise may evolve with time. Uh, you would like also to reuse what you've done uh, across tasks. So this is also very difficult. Uh, if you uncraft a strategy, if you move from train station, tra to, uh, yeah, train ticket booking to information about tourist uh, or about restaurants, how do you how do you use the things that you've done for the first task to another task. That's very difficult to, to do. So we'd like to, to do that automatically. And there is a very big issue, which is the, the large amount of possible states, possible state situations in which the system can actually be. The, the, the number of things that the user can say uh, is very large, and you have to handle all these things uh, and take decisions about uh, what you've recognized. So this is why, uh, oh, for, be, because of all these challenges, we think about using machine learning, because machine learning can auto automatically handle all these things, uh, stochasticity, non-determinism, uh, uh, maybe uh, non-stationarity, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, but, uh, and actually this is done everywhere in dialog systems nowadays. Uh, and especially it's been done in speech recognition for decades, uh, for like uh, in the, the 70s with HMMs. Now it's uh, deep neural networks, the fancy stuff to, to do uh, speech recognition or speech understanding is deep neural networks today. But I mean, it, it, machine learning evolved through time uh, in spoken dialogue system, but mainly stayed here and here. and here and here, in the blue parts of the, of the dialogue systems, you can find today a lot of literature about using machine learning to solve the problems of speech recognition, speech understanding, generation, and TTS. There is fewer work about task modeling, that will be the topic of this afternoon, and few work uh, about dialogue management, uh, how, to use, how to use machine learning uh, to, how to uh, learn a good dialogue strategy. So this will be the topic of this morning. Actually, in all the blue modules you have here, uh, you can find mainly supervised or unsupervised learning. So you will find uh, classification or uh, uh, clustering and things like that. So if you uh, if you do speech recognition, you will train a speech. Uh, HMM. Uh, if you train an HMM, you need actually examples of speech exam uh, with uh, phonetic translation, and then you you, you train by uh, EM uh, algorithm your HMM, and it's a, a matter of uh, supervised learning. You actually can use unsupervised learning, for example, for uh, uh, init uh, initialization of uh, HMMs or uh, or, by, or of uh, deep networks. Uh, yeah. no, nowadays, I think, uh, deep networks can be trained directly with supervised learning, but at the, yeah, let's say five years ago, you needed some unsupervised learning to initialize the deep network, uh, etc. But uh, can we use supervised learning or unsupervised learning to, to train dialogues, to, to find automatically dialogue strategies? Actually, uh, no. Uh, we cannot, uh, at least, uh, I will explain later that we actually can, but no. Uh, at first uh, sight, uh, it's very difficult to cast the dialogue strategy mod, uh, learning as uh, supervised learning. Why is that? It's actually because the dialogue, uh, finding a strategy for a dialogue is actually finding a sequential, a strict sequence of decision. It's not a static decision. It's not matching one uh, situation to one decision. It's actually trying to find what will be the best sequence of decisions that will lead the system to provide you the, the, the good information over time. As I said, the dialogue is built over time. And what you want is to learn what are the different decisions that will lead the most naturally or the most efficiently to provide you with the, the, the good information. 
So it is a sequential process, and it's not a static problem. It's not about matching situation uh, inputs to outputs. It's about finding a sequence of decision. Of course, there is also the problem that the inputs are multidimensional hybrid uh, inputs. Uh, hybrid, I mean by hybrid, I mean that can it, it can actually actually be uh, numbers or words. You know, you are talking to a machine, so you are to trans you are transmitting words to the machine. This is actually uh, symbolic information. So you can actually have numerical information that you translate that you send to the machine, and you can actually have to, uh, semantic information. So this is very hard also to to use. Uh, I mean, how do you model uh, such such hybrid space? And another problem that will arise when you uh, uh, when you try to learn uh, uh, by supervised learning. So let's say that okay, you, there is a method. Actually, there is no, but Let's say that there is a method that would allow you to learn a sequence of decision by supervised learning. Then you would actually have, you would need some example of perfect sequences of decisions to match uh, by supervised learning. And this actually doesn't exist. Human strategies, human handcrafted strategies, have no guarantees of optimality. You know, because you cannot think about all the possible situations in which the system will. Uh, uh, arise, you, you cannot think about all the, possibly, the possible inputs of the human, then you cannot have optimal decision for all these inputs. So there is no way to guarantee the optimality of uncrafted strategies. Yeah? yeah. Uh, so on the other hand, uh, uncrafted, it's not a machine which is like that. It's mm -hmm. a human, yep. and the human has experience. Yeah, but it has, it has experience. Of course, now the argument is. So that means we try to use to put down our experience. I can't craft it. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's okay. Um, uh, so I think that this is an important knowledge that we put. Mm -hmm. yep. Which actually may be a good thing for the future for the country. Mm -hmm. And now, on the other hand, the argument, the second argument, is that we are human. We don't know all the possibilities. Mm -hmm. But even the machine does not know all the, all the possibilities because all the possibilities are known. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a data from where you can get information. And uh, it's difficult to get information from a machine that is yep. large data. So these are my <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, actually, uh, the. Um, so for the, the the second argument, machine, you know, in machine learning, there is the well, I, I will come to that later, but there is the what we call the the <coughs> bias and variance uh, trade-off. Actually, having too many having too many data is not good either to generalize. So it's not a, it's not only about data; it's about how, how to correctly model the, the 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 state space, the generalization framework. So, for example, SVMs are non-parametric systems, non-parametric uh, machine learning. Methods where you actually find uh, automatically a way to represent your data and to generalize as well as possible. So this is more about generalization than about getting good data. You, you need the right data, not many data. You need the right data and the right uh, representation of your of your input space. This is the, the for the for the first, for the second, and for the third. Uh, for the first, actually, you you human are. Experience to talk with humans without noise, or with noise, as you explained. But with noise, uh, I mean, uh, you, it's it's. Uh, if you, we would have to to model what is the noise arising in speech in uh, speech recognition, so that we have the correct information by a human. You, you would have to simulate what speech recognition errors are, then transmit this information to a human and look what what would be the decision of you of a human in face of this kind of noise. And humans are not expert to interact through speech recognition systems. So this is why you cannot just trans, uh, transfer human knowledge to systems, because systems are more stochastic than humans, actually. So this is, this is actually, this is why uh, uncrafted uh, policies are not so, uh, there is no guarantee of, uh, of optimality. Uh, but it, of course, it is, it is a good starting point, and you, you can, of course, use this uh, 
an, an encrusted strategy as a starting, starting point for learning, but you cannot expect it as to, uh, to be the example of what you should learn. The difference? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Welcome. Yeah, and by the way, if you have any question, uh, just feel free to stop me at any point, because uh, there might be some tough points at some point. I will. Have dialogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea is to have a dialogue about dialogue systems. <laughs> Since we recorded, yeah, we <laughs> for uh, develop a dialogue manager for, for classrooms. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Okay, so we actually have other constraints that we want to uh, take into account to model, uh, to to find the best machine learning technique for. Uh, Spoken dialogue system. So you act, you would actually like to use recorded data, as just as uh, Yanis just said. So you would. Th there are many dialogue systems around. They all use logs. So you can actually use the logs of existing dialogue system. You would like to use the logs of existing dialogue systems to learn from these logs what is the best strategy. So you would like to learn batch. But of course, all these dialogues were not perfect, so you want to improve over time, and you, will, you would like also to uh, handle non-stationarity, so you, would like, you also would like to learn online. So this is a constraint. You want a system that is able to learn batch and to learn online. You want, of course, a, sample that is, uh, a system that is uh, a, a machine learning technique that is sample efficient, because there are, the, the, the data about dialogues are very hard to collect because you have to annotate a lot of semantic information, etc. So this is, this is very hard to collect and to, to annotate. So you would like to be sample efficient so that you need a very uh, small data set to learn. And you also, and if you learn online, you don't want the user to be uh, just a trainee of the system for years. So uh, you, you, you actually would like to learn online very efficiently so that each interaction would bring some uh, improvement into your system. So you want to learn without disturbing the user, you know, just not to try and see what happens. So that's, uh, that's, that's something that you want to avoid. You want, of course, to, uh, to scale up with uh, dealing with uncertainty. You want to reuse across tasks. Uh, you want to track optimal con solutions. So tracking is also a very important uh, feature you would like to, uh, to get. Uh, as I said, since the user can change his behavior, you want to track uh, over time what is the optimal solution according to this moving uh, behavior and of course the stochastic behavior of the user. So now let's see what we have in the literature. In the literature we have supervised learning like uh, neural networks, SVMs, uh, HMMs, etc. So what is, what is supervised learning formally? Le supervised learning is a method that learns a mapping between inputs and outputs given some data. So an oracle, so you have a, a data of uh, x and y, and you want to, to find a function f of x that gives the same y for any x in the, in the input space. So uh, you have labeled examples, and you want to find the real mapping between inputs and outputs. And this is supervised learning. Unsupervised learning is actually a, a way to structure data so in unsupervised learning, you got a bunch of data, and you don't have labels for these data, but you know that they are from n clusters, for example. And you want to cluster the, the data in n clusters so that in each cluster you have similar data. But you don't know, you don't have a label for, the, for each data point. So there is no example provided. It's just a bunch of inputs, and you want to cluster these inputs. This is unsupervised learning. So this will not work because uh, you would need examples of perfect uh, sequences of decisions uh, to match. Uh, so you would need this. You would need an oracle to give you this uh, perfect this, uh, sequences of decisions. This would not work neither because you would you would need to cluster. If you wanted to use unsupervised learning to learn uh, dialogue strategies, you would actually need to have plenty of different strategies and cluster good ones and bad ones. And the problem is that how to represent a strategy, a strategy is usually, you can represent a strategy by its output, so the, the, the sequences of dialogues that it will generate, but these sequences can be of different length. And usually supervi unsupervised learning uh, assumes that all the vectors you try to cluster are the same length, the same size. So this is very difficult to, it would be very difficult to use unsupervised learning to 
to uh, learn dialogue systems, dialogue strategies, and there is a third one. There is a third uh, learning method that you can find in the in the literature, which is actually reinforcement learning. So that is uh, usually not known to people who knows about reinforcement learning in the room. So reinforcement learning is a third type of uh, of learning, uh, which is actually learning by uh, being rewarded. So what you do is to learn, you learn to behave. You don't learn a mapping from input to input, but you learn to take decisions over time. It's normally an online uh, learning. Uh, I will show you after that we can make it batch, uh, but uh, it's naturally an online learning. So you actually try things and keep the best. So you learn by interacting. It's not that you, usually you don't learn from observing uh, a batch of data, but you learn from interaction. And it learns uh, sequential decision making. And how does it work, actually? It actually works based on rewarded systems. It is a rewarded, it's, uh, it, you learn from being rewarded for good uh, decisions and being punished for bad decisions. So the idea is you have an agent that is supposed to learn. And this agent is interacting with some environment. So interacting means I decide to do something. So I apply an action. I select an action in my environment. And my environment will change uh, with time. My observations of the environment will change with time. So for example, this. This agent, which is a mouse, wants to interact with a maze to find some cheese. So what are the actions the mouse can do? It can actually go up, down, right, left. These are the actions. So if I decide to go down, then my observation of the environment will change. I don't see the same walls anymore at the same place. So my observation will change. And my position will change. So the state, my state, my, yeah, my, my situation will change. The, the, the way I perceive the, the environment changes, and the way and my, situa my actual situation changes with time. OK, so if I move down, actually, I don't get any cheese. So I get a reward, which is 0, because I don't get any cheese. And I will only get 1, a reward of 1, when I get cheese. So if I move down, then uh, right, and then down, and then go around, and I find cheese there, I will get a reward of one. And actually, this is, very, this is a very important modeling for dialogue system because as I said, you can actually tell after you interacted with the machine that it was bad or it was good. So you interact, the, the machine will interact with you and after the end of the interaction, it, you, you just say, well, you, the, the machine asks to the user, well, was it good? And you say, no, it was not good, so minus one, okay? Or yes, it was good, okay, plus one. And you learn what to do so as to reach, to, so as to collect the maximum of uh, rewards. So the idea is not about saying them to the machine what to do. Uh, no, it's not, it's not about saying to the machine how to do things. It's not about saying to the machine, well, at that position in the dialogue, you should have said that and not that because it was bad. It's like here for the, the mouse, you don't say to the mouse, well, there you should have gone you should not go this way, but you should go this way. No, it's just that once it reached the cheese, it knows that it was good. And for a dialogue system, it's actually the same. Once the dialogue is over, you can say it was good or it was not good, but you, even if you cannot say where was the error of the dialogue system, you can at least say, well, this was good or this was not good. Okay, so is it, is it okay for the reinforcement learning paradigm? You all got it, yeah? Uh, yeah, I could. <laughs> <laughs> the reward procedure is uh, supervised. It's done by okay, uh, we, actually, by a transcriber, by by a human, by yeah. Well, it's, it's different. Diff well, it's different for different applications, uh, but uh, it could be. I mean, but uh, you could also have expert information into into uh, to, you could put in expert information into the reward. Like you don't want the, the dialogue to be long. You want the user to have uh, to get this inf this information at the end, 
So all this can be included in the reward and say, and you optimize this reward. Uh, so this could be actually the user saying, I don't, I didn't like, I liked, or this could be an expert saying, well, I, I want short dialogues, I want efficient dialogues, I want natural dialogues, etc. So you could actually use different ways of representing the reward. Okay, so no other questions about the reinforcement learning paradigm? I mean, I will talk about this for the next hour and a half, so uh, <laughs> you'd better get to catch it. Okay, okay so actually, for, more formally, reinforcement learning has been introduced, I think, uh, Reinforcement learning has been introduced in psychology in the beginning of the previous century, so it's a very old model. But formally, it's been introduced like this by Bellman in the 50s. You actually have an agent which tries to interact with an environment, which is a black, black box. So this is black by purple. You know. This is a black box. You don't know it, how it works. But you, act, you don't have any idea of how it works inside. You, all what you know is that when you do some action, it gives you some state. You observe that it's, it's the state of the environment changes, and it gives you some reward. Okay? So the idea of reinforcement learning is that I have to select the action according to the state in which I am, so that I maximize accumulate, uh, accumulate function of rewards. So I don't want to, in the, the, it's, real, it's really important to understand that you want to accumulate rewards over time and not to uh, maximize the immediate reward. You don't want to select the action in a given state that will provide you with the maximum reward in that state. But what you want is to collect the maximum of rewards over time. This is how you learn sequential decision making and not static decision making. Because you want to, to, uh, to learn how to accumulate the maximum of rewards. For example, uh, you play chess. What you want when you play chess is to win the game. You don't care about lo losing pieces. You don't, you don't care about the, the opponent to catch pieces over time if you win the game. So you can take decisions that look bad locally if it uh, leads to uh, winning the game. Yeah? How do you know that's, that's, that's the whole purpose of, the, of uh, reinforcement learning, is how to learn from delayed rewards. So I, I will explain. This is exactly what, what I will explain. It's all to learn from delayed rewards. So th this is, by, normally, by essence, it is supposed to be a trial, error, uh, trial and error process. You, so you, you try, you get rewards, and you know whether it was good or not. Uh, and so all the reinforcement learning problem is all to learn a mapping, which we will call a policy, and we'll note pi for policy, between states and actions. So you want to, given an, a state as an input, you want to have a function that maps this state to an action so that you accumulate the maximum of rewards over time. So this is the idea of reinforcement learning. Of course, uh, actually reinforcement learning is defined as a problem and not as a solution. Uh, the problem of reinforcement learning is how to find a mapping between state and action so that I accumulate the most uh, reward over time. So there are solutions to, to that problem algorithm for reinforcement learning, but reinforcement learning is actually a problem and not a solution. <laughs> it's defined as a problem. Okay, so how do we, that, no, com, coming back to dialogues, so how do we model dialogues as a reinforcement learning problem? Well, I, I shouldn't have written this, but uh, uh, how, do I, how do I cast a dialogue problem into a reinforcement learning problem? I have actually to define what is a state, what is an action, and what is, a, what is the reward. And then I can model, I, I would be able to use the reinforcement learning algorithms to solve the problem of dialogue system, of dialogue strategy learning. So what is the state? Actually, the state <coughs> will be the, uh, uh, so the state will be uh, the context in which I am. So I am in, in I gathered information so far from the user, and this amount of information I gathered is actually the context the situation in which I am uh, in a dialogue system. So, for example, in my uh, tourist information system, I, at, at some point I knew what was the what was the, the location and the type of cuisine. These information are uh, in the state. This is the state. I know this. Okay. So the actions the dialogue system can 
perform are communicative acts, like greet the user, asking for a question to the user, asking for confirmation about some information I got from the user. These are actions the system can uh, perform. And the reward, it's the most difficult stuff actually to define in a, in a, in, a in, such, in the casting of dialogue systems into reward in reinforcement learning. Is the usually we, you would like to to uh, optimize the user satisfaction. So user satisfaction is that well you got what you wanted in a natural way, etc. This is very difficult to uh, to model in practice. So yeah, there are work, there are still ongoing work. To define what is the best reward, but of course the, the easiest the easiest way uh, to optimize a, a, a dialogue system would, would be to ask to people, well, was it nice or was it was it bad? Okay, so if I come back to my uh, dialogue system, my, my the, the the dialogue task I've been talking about just before, uh, actually you have uh, you have three pieces of information you want to uh, get from the user, and this will be part of the state. Did I get this information or not? So we will here build a very simple uh, state representation, which doesn't take into account what was the answer to the question in which location uh, would you like a restaurant, but uh, did you answer this question? That's all. So there are three inf pieces of information that you want to get from the system. And uh, these three pieces of, inform of information will be part of the state. Did I get slot one, slot two, and slot three? And then I will add two, the, two more information into the state space. Uh, the first one is, did I greet the user? Because I should start with this. So did I, did, it? did I do it? Did I greet the user? And did I provide information to, to the user? If I provided information to the user, it's probably time to conclude. So this information I uh, are important to take decisions. Did I get the information and did I greet, did I inform the user with some, uh, uh, did I give information to the user about the restaurant? So the, de the decisions, the actions that the system can uh, perform are asking for a slot, confirming for a slot, greeting the user, uh, inform of results and saying bye, so closing the dialogue. And the reward can be just plus one if uh, you provided information about the restaurant to, uh, uh, to the user and zero otherwise. So this is a very simple way of describing the dialogue. It's not the best way, uh, of course. I'm, I'm aware about this, but it's just to show you how this will evolve with time. So uh, at the beginning, I've shown, I've shown you a, a dialogue with uh, spoken outputs. Here, it's the same dialogue, but with state of, uh, evolving, evolving with time. So you greet the, 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 the system greet the user, so the state goes from zero everywhere to one for the greeting. The user didn't say anything, so the state doesn't change. Then the, uh, the system asks for the location, the, the, the user provides information about the, the, the location, but also about the, 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 the type of cuisine, location and type of cuisine. Then the system asks for the price range, then you get information for the, from the price range, and then the system informs you about what the, which restaurant corresponds to your uh, requirement, and all the, the state will change to one everyone, uh, one everywhere, and uh, when it's one everywhere, then it's time to conclude that the system should say bye. Okay, so this is how the state will evolve with, with time. And it's according to this, to this vector that the, uh, the machine should learn that if I greet the user and I don't get in, uh, any information, then I, I should ask for one slot, for example. So this is the decision learned uh, from, to, to match this state. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, so, in this case, we make the assumption that we c the system cannot ask uh, the same question uh, twice. Am I right? Uh, no, it could, but it would be stupid here because, uh, as I said, we, we assume that there is a perfect recognition by the system of what you said. So, if you say, if you say I, got, uh, I want a cheap, uh, I want an Italian restaurant close, to, by, close by the river, uh, the system catches it and can fill the, the slots in, in the, internally. So it doesn't have to ask twice. So this is actually a perfect dialogue where everything. 
everything goes well and uh, the system learns to perform well as well by asking the, the, the right question. But uh, I don't make any assumption about uh, if I ask some question, I cannot ask it twice. There is no such assumption. It could ask it twice, but uh, it learned that it shouldn't. Okay, so I'll go through reinforcement learning now. Uh, uh, so I explained to you what, what was the problem, and now I'll try to tell you about some solutions. Okay, the first thing is that to, uh, it's to cast the, the problem in some statistical representation. So reinforcement learning will be based on uh, what we call Markov decision processes. So what is a Markov decision process? It's actually a, a, a state, um, a state machine uh, where you actually have two different nodes. So it's a graph in which we have two, two different nodes. There, there are nodes for states, which are the big, big empty circles. And there are nodes for actions, which are the small uh, plane circles. So you, we will model uh, the, the environment. So we don't know how the black box works, but we will model it as a Markov decision process. And what is a Markov decision process? So in some state, you actually have, uh, you can take decisions. It's modeled by the pi here. So in state S, the, uh, there is a probability according to the current policy of selecting action two in, uh, in state one. And this will lead to state two. So I, if I select action A2 in state one, I go to state two. See? And this gives me a reward associated to this transition. There is also a probability that I will select action one. And if I select action one in state one, I can either end up in ST, which is a terminal state, or also in state two. So this models the, the non-determinism of uh, dialog systems. It means that if I ask for some, something to the user, I ask a question to the user, I may, have a question, I, I may have an answer to this question, but also to other questions. It's, it's exactly what happened in, in the dialog. I ask for the location, and I, I, uh, I clear the location and the type of cuisine. So I could have just a location, and I could have type of cuisine in addition. So there is a probability from, from, from if I select action one in state one, to go into two different states. And so I would get two different rewards. OK, so formally, a Markov decision process is actually a tuple in which you have a set of state, a set of actions, a set of probabilities of stepping from one step to another, from one state to another state, given the action I have chosen in the, in the, in, in the current state. So I, I'm in the current state, I select an action, I have probability to, to uh, step to another state. So there is a pro this is a set of probabilities of stepping from state to state, given uh, the uh, action I've taken, and rewards. So this is a, a set of rewards that are associated to each transition from one state to another. And this is gamma. I will tell you later about uh, this, uh, this term. So the probabilities are supposed to be Markovian. This is why it is called a Markov decision process. It is a Markov decision pro process because the probability of going from one state to another is from one state to another, sorry, is actually only a function of the current state and the current action, and not what I did before. So this is very also very important because when you build a dialogue system, it means that you you, meet, you need to meet the Markov assumption to use reinforcement learning. That means that everything that you need to take a decision has to be known in the, the current state. So you don't you have to gather all the information that you collected in the past into the current state, so that you can take decision for the next state. So the the whole story of the dialogue should be contained in the current state. You don't need to remember what happened uh, three turns around in your dialog, three, three, three turns ago. And the same for the reward. The reward is only uh, a function of the, the current transition and not of what happened before. So this is very important. The Markov, Markov property is about the, the probabilities, transition probabilities, but also about the reward. The reward has to be 
something related to the current transition and what, not about what happened in the past. Okay, so again, more formally, what we want to find is a policy. A policy is a mapping from states to actions. So in the general case, you can actually have states to probabilities over action. So this would be a non-deterministic policy. It means that you will learn the probabilities of selecting actions in given states. But usually you will have deterministic uh, uh, policies, that is a map, deterministic mapping between state and actions. So in one state, one action. But you could actually have a probability over uh, actions. It also works. And so now comes the question of how to learn from delayed rewards. So you actually <coughs> uh, define uh, a specific function which we call the value function for each state. So each state will be, will be associated, to each state will be associated a value function which is the expected cumulative reward over time. So if I start in, in state S and follow the policy pi, I will accumulate rewards after each interaction and I will accumulate this reward over time I will do that many, many times. So I will start from the same state many, many times, ap uh, applying the same policy, make the expectation over the, all these times, and this will give me, give me the value function. I accept this for the moment. Of course, it's not possible to do that, but the idea of the, the, the definition of the value function is I start from S many times, apply the policy, collect the rewards, and uh, make the, the average over all the trials I have done. And there is this gamma here. Gamma is smaller than one and bigger than zero. Why is this? For convergence. Yeah. Because of course, if, if I have positive rewards all the time and I sum over an infinite number of steps, it always goes to, the, to infinity. So every, every policy is optimal because every policy gives you an infinity, an infinite number of rewards, so bad. So you use this gamma for convergence so that the value function is not going towards to infinity. <clears throat> okay, uh, this is the first definition you really have to get because it will, the, the rest of the talk will be a lot of uh, about this. And there is another function which is actually giving you one degree of freedom for the first action. So you are in a state you can choose any action A, you step to another state, and from that other state, you will follow policy pi. So there, there is a, a new value that is associated to the current state and any other action, any action in your action set for this state. So what is the purpose of this function compared to this one? This one is actually evaluating what you are doing, and this one is saying, well, if there is an action for which this function is greater than this one, then it means that probably this action is better than the one that is in, that is in your current policy. You selected an action in the first state which is different from your current policy, the one you've learned so far, and this leads to a higher accumulated reward in average. So you should change your policy to take this action instead of the action is which is in your policy. Yep. This is the key. Yeah. For example, yeah, you can start with an encrafted policy, measure what is the value for every state of this, of this encrafted policy, and you can try other actions for the, state, the first state and see whether this improves your encrafted policy. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Predefined. Yeah, because you have to find the maximum. So find the maximum. You could find the maximum on a continuous function, but it's much harder. So you would have to derive this at zero. So that's. Uh, so yeah, the, but usually that's what happens. You have a, a finite number. Even even if you do robotics, you go you go. Uh, you can discretize the state space, the, the action space. But that's that's an open question. How to do that for uh, continuous question, uh, continuous actions. Okay, so now that I've defined, so it, is it okay for the, these two functions? You are okay? 
Now that I've defined those two uh, functions, what do I actually want? What I actually want is the policy pi star, which is the optimal, optimal one. The optimal one is the one that for all policies will give you the maximum value for every state. So this is actually a way to say that for every state S in my state space, I want to find the policy that will provide me the maximum cumulative reward for every state. So, well, th this is the same for Q. But what does that mean for Q? It means that I actually can choose the, I, I, can, I actually can derive the policy from the Q function of the optimal policy. So the idea of this line is that if I know the Q function of the optimal policy, then I just have to select the action that maximizes the cumulative reward in every state. So, and then I can have the, maxi, the, the, the optimal policy. So what does that mean? That means that finding an optimal policy is about finding, it's about learning this function. Okay? If I can learn this function, I can find the policy. And this is a, a real key in reinforcement learning, is that I cast it policy learning into function learning, which is easier. <laughs> it's easier to, to find a function than a sequence of decision. So all this is just all about, uh, all what I said so far is just all about casting sequential decision making into learning a function. So that doesn't say how to learn this function, <laughs> but it comes. So, yeah, well, there are different uh, ways uh, of defining uh, the cumulative reward. Uh, I will use this one, as we said, because of convergence uh, properties. But we could actually use, if, if we have finitarism uh, learning, we could learn we don't have problems about convergence. If, we, if the interactions doesn't go for an infinite number of time uh, of steps, uh, then it never goes to infinity. So we could use this one. But we will use this one because there, we have, there are a lot of proofs of convergence for algorithms with this one and not for this one. We could also use the average gain over time. But, uh, so I, what I mean is that in the definition here, I use this with gamma, but I could also use uh, this or this. But there are little work, well, there are a lot of work uh, in the literature about convergence about, uh, of algorithms based on this definition of the, uh, the cumulative gain. But it's very difficult, actually. This is easy to demonstrate. All, uh, all the algorithms, the convergence of all algorithms are easier to demonstrate with this than with this. So, okay, so, well, I, I will not talk about this one. It's uh, actually already, uh, already talked about that. Sorry? You want to break now? Has it, I yeah. Uh, I, I go for Five more minutes, if you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what we actually want in reinforcement learning is, uh, so as I said, to uh, maximize this. And uh, this value. And or we want to learn this one for the the optimal policy. So yeah, these are formal definitions of what I've said before. But what is important? No. So if you look at this look at this definition of the, the reward. So actually, I stepped into a K, but uh, I mean, this is to say that uh, at time T, I mean, as T, and uh, so I have to add T here, but uh, it's, it's exactly the same uh, definition as before. But if you look actually at this definition, you can extract the first reward. And the first reward will be with gamma exponent 0. So it's one. So you can extract this first reward from the, the sum, and then sum over one, and continue. So that's what, uh, what I do here. Just extract from, the, the, from the, the summation the first reward. And then I have exactly the same here as before, except that I start at two, and I have gamma in front. So what does that mean? It means that thanks to the Markov property, because everything that will happen in the future only depends on what 
happens now and not what happened in the, in the past, I can actually rewrite this expectation as some function of the current reward plus the value function plus gamma, the value function of the next step. What does what does it mean? It means that if I if I'm in one state, I step to the other state, I get a reward. Then the accumulative reward I can associate it associate to the current step is the immediate reward plus the cumulative reward I will get from the next step. And the cumulative reward I can get from the next step is the value function of the next step. Okay? So this means that it is, it is a recursive problem. See, and actually, if my policy is stochastic, I can average over action, and I can also write V in function of Q. So we have V in function of V. V is of S is a function of E of S prime. So this means actually that the values of each state cannot be are linked to the value of other states around. If I can, if I step from one state to another, I get the, the immediate reward and the cumulative reward from the next step. And there are different probabilities of going to the other steps. This is why this is the expectation. So the expectation is here is about the transition probabilities. So I rewrote the expectation according to uh, to the uh, transition probabilities from state, uh, state to state. So the idea is that I am in a state, I do an action, I have, I have probabilities to go in different states, and the reward I can expect in the first state is the immediate reward, the average immediate reward, plus the average value function of the possible next states. Okay? So, and if my policy is uh, a stochastic one, if I want to find the value function of the current state, I have to average over all the actions I can take in this, uh, in this state. So if I, that's actually my next slide, if I rewrite this, so I have the Q function is a function of the, the Q function of S A is a value function of the next state, is function of the value function of the next state. I can average over actions. And if I combine two, these two equations, I come up with this equation, which is actually saying that the value function of my current state depends on the value function of the next state, the possible next states uh, if it's a stochastic process, because of the Markov property. Okay. So actually, it's a part of the solution. This is this is a system of equations that you can solve. It's a system of linear equation that you can solve by any method you like for linear, for linear uh, systems. And so you can evaluate your current policy. Thanks to this, you can evaluate your current policy. If you know the probabilities associated. To, your, to, to the action selection in each state for your current policy, you can evaluate it and know whether it's good or not. You can know, you, you can exactly know what will be the reward associated to each state, the cumulative reward associated to each state. So uh, this has been done. So I took this uh, from uh, the book by uh, Saturn and Barto, uh, who, did the, who wrote the, the most cited book about reinforcement learning. So. The idea of this task is, uh, is a ro like a, a grid world task. So you are an agent in a grid world. You can go uh, north, south, east, west. If you arrive in this uh, uh, state, if you end up in this state, it will immediately bring you in this state and provide you with a reward of 10. If you are here, to uh, come here, then it will automatically bring you there and give you a reward of plus five. And I want to evaluate what is the, the, value, the value of the random policy. I'm in a state and I do random, just to see what happens. And this is actually the value of the random policy. So you see that this state has the highest value. So if I want to improve my policy, not to be random anymore, what should I do when I'm here, for example? So I'm, I'm doing random, and I accumulate 
the most reward when I'm here. So I should try to go there. <laughs> so I changed my policy, going from random to when I'm here, I'm not, I'm not random anymore. I just turn left, and I will accumulate more rewards. So this is the first step towards learning the best policy, is to evaluate the current policy. Your current policy is evaluated. And you can, tell, well, you can say, well, uh, I should change my policy because uh, it's better going this way than the other way. OK, so actually, this is the equations for, th these are the equations for the, the optimal uh, value function. Actually, the optimal value function is, since it's uh, the maximum over P of all the value functions for, any pol for all the policies, it's actually the maximum over A of the uh, the uh, value of the, the the Q value of the optimal policy, and so you can actually write that the value function is the maximum over A and not the average over all the possible A given the policy of this uh, uh, value. So remember, uh, if you look here, I said that V as a function of Q was the average over all the action. If you want the best action, you take the max, and you don't take the average. OK, so uh, this is also um, well, I should probably skip this. So I, I'm going to skip this, but uh, yeah, the idea is that you could, you could also get uh, the best value function out of this, this uh, the, uh, having the max here, if you change Q for its, uh, for its uh, value, you will see that the only, the only place where you have uh, an action is in the, the next Q value. So the max goes only in front of this. So I mean, the Q function here will be uh, the Q function for the, the, for the, uh, the optimal policy is given by this. It's also a recursive. Uh, equation and it's also a set of uh, you see this is also a set of equations that you could solve but it's not a linear uh, system anymore because of the max and that's a problem actually because before you put for evaluating the policy uh, it was easy because it was a linear system but know that you want the best policy you need to introduce a maximum uh, uh, operator and this maximum oper operator is not linear and so you cannot solve this easily because it's not a linear system anymore okay so for evaluating your policy it's easy for finding the best one it's not so easy but actually and I will conclude uh, this first part here actually there is a, a cool thing <laughs> that Bellman showed uh, in the 50s that uh, you see, uh, he says that he rewrites this uh, as a, uh, uh, well, he rewrites it like this actually. So Q is a Q is actually equal to an operator applied to Q. And this operator is noted B. And this operator is all these things. And what he, sh he has shown is that actually this operator is a contraction. So everybody knows what is a contraction or no? OK, so a contraction is a, a mathematical operator that makes closer uh, to uh, function if you, so for example I apply B to Q1 and B to Q2 this will be smaller than alpha Q1 minus Q2 with alpha like this so what does that mean it means that when I apply B to two functions then the two functions get closer to each other okay and it's uh, the same for, uh, well, an example of uh, a contraction is uh, the division by two. Division by two, for example, I have 16 and I have uh, eight. 
I apply division by two. So I had eight. Right? So it goes from eight equal to eight. And this is equal to four. So it's smaller. So it's going. It's it makes things closer to each other. And the good thing is that any contraction has a fixed point. A fixed point is uh, some some value, some function that will not move if I apply the operator again. For the division by two, for example, the fixed point is zero. And zero uh, divided by two is zero. It doesn't change. Okay. So if I want to find the fixed point of any operator, of any contraction, I just have to apply. So I, I do x minus the fixed point. I apply uh, the division by 2. So it's x2. So that means that if I, because this one doesn't move. So this means that if I apply recursively, starting from any point, I apply the operator to the to, uh, my starting <laughs> so there is a way that's, that just means that there is a way to find the best the, the, the Q function of the optimal policy I, I wrote it by, for V here but it also works for Q star so if I, the, if I use this definition yeah, if I, this operator is actually a contraction as well so if I apply this operator to any starting Q I will tend towards Q star So, yeah. Um, so actually, yeah, I'll just stop after that. There are, there are two different uh, algorithms to find the best policy. The first one is called value iteration and is based on the first evaluation scheme I told you before. So you can actually evaluate your current policy and improve it, as I told you. So you, you see what is the value of your current policy and you see that there is an action that improves this policy in some states. So you change your policy, improve it according to the, the, to, to the, evaluate, the current evaluation of your policy. That makes a new policy that you evaluate again and the evaluation is done by a linear system. So you can, you can loop over cycles of evaluation and improvement and you will also tend toward the best uh, policy. Or you can do what uh, I just said before. You can solve the no, that's, that's policy iteration. So that was policy iteration. And so value iteration is the, the, the thing I told you just before. So value iteration is uh, solving this by applying recursively the Bellman operator to any starting point. And there is another algorithm, which is actually called uh, policy iteration, which is based on the evaluation. And the evaluation is linear. It can be solved by any linear programming uh, system or any uh, solver for of linear uh, systems. And once you have the evaluation of your current policy, you can improve it because you've seen that there is an action that has a best value, a better value than the, 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 the current one. So this gives you a new policy 
this new policy, you can evaluate it again using this, but you changed, uh, uh, I mean, you, you uh, yeah, so you, you evaluate your new policy according to, to, the, to, to the, uh, the new set of actions. You have a new evaluation, you watch again at this evaluation, you check whether there is another action that is better than the, the one you selected before, etc. And once all the action, all the, the actions you take provides you the, 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 the largest uh, reward for every state, then you are done. That's the best policy. Okay. So from what I've said, two algorithms, one is applying the Bellman optimality operator iteratively from any starting point, and you will converge to the, the, to the, to the best one, to the Q function of the, the optimal policy. Second algorithm is policy iteration. Policy iteration is evaluating the current policy, improve it, evaluating again the improved policy, improve it until it doesn't change, by, you can improve it anymore. And that tends toward the, the optimal policy as well. Okay, so I stop here uh, for five minutes and then uh, so let's start again. Uh, just before I start again, I wanted to stress that uh, I wanted to stress that the, all the, what I said here has been uh, developed in the 50s. So value iteration is from 57 and Policy iteration is from 1960. So, you know, it's been there for a while. But applied to reinforcement learning quite recently and uh, to uh, dialogue modeling quite recently. So, actually, we have a problem with what I've said so far is that, as I said, we, to, to apply these two algorithms, you need to know this operator, and this operator, the Bellman operator, includes the transition probabilities. Of course, you don't know the transi transition probabilities when you interact with humans. You don't know that the human will have a probability of that amount to say something and that amount to say something else. So these transition probabilities are unknown. So this is why we switch to another uh, paradigm. What the, the two algorithms I've told, I've told you about now are called dynamic programming uh, algorithms. So they've been named like this by uh, Bellman in the 50s. It's dynamic programming. Dynamic programming supposed that assumes that you actually know the transition probabilities, the reward function everywhere in every state for every action, etc. So this, of course, is not known in dialogue system. You don't know either the, the you don't know the, reward, the the transition probabilities, and maybe you don't even know the rewards if the, if the user, if you ask the user what is your your feeling about the dialogue. You don't know the probabilities about getting this or this reward according to the to the dialogue. So this might also be unknown. So you are in an unknown environment, but you still want to use this paradigm of reinforcement learning. So a first method, which is actually naive, but works so so, is actually you tr you could actually sample the environment to learn those probabilities. Just well, what happens when I do this in this state, this action in this state and you see how you step to another state. You count the number of time you stepped to another state, and that's the probability uh, of stepping from one state to another according to the action you make. So this is called adaptive uh, dynamic programming. And this actually has been applied. It's not the first algorithm, first algor uh, reinforcement learning algorithm that has been applied to dialogue system, but it's the most simple. It's, and it's been applied by uh, Sink, uh, Walker, Littmann and Kearns uh, in 1999. Uh, it's been uh, published at NIPS, the machine learning conference, not the speech processing conference. So application of reinforcement learning to dialogue systems is back to, it's 50, uh, 15 years old only, while dynamic programming is 60 years old. And it's been applied to a quite simple dialogue system with 64 states five actions, and they actually learned the model from 200 dialogues, which is a small amount of dialogues, but it's also a small system. So the first, the first, uh, so Elvis and Toot were uh, a male, Elvis was a male spooling and Toot was a train scheduling system. So the, the, the state, 
well, so quite a small number of states, five actions, and uh, they could actually estimate the error bound on the value function, and these error bounds were quite big because they had a small number of, uh, of uh, dialogues. Okay, but there is actually maybe better ways to, uh, to learn the dialogue policy. The first, the first one that has been proposed uh, is actually to use Monte Carlo methods to estimate the value function. So the idea is that you start at any state and uh, you, have a, well, you, you have a first policy, you have a first uh, uh, policy pi, for example, an uncrafted policy. You start in any state, you follow uh, your policy, Exactly the, the the same way as I said as I defined the reward function, the value function. You estimate the value function just by running your policy a large number of time, starting from any state. You evaluate this policy, uh, the, the the Q value of this policy, and uh, you actually improve your policy by selecting the the, the best action according to this evaluation. So uh, of course that means that. But this, this is actually the first algorithm, reinforcement algorithm that has been proposed uh, in the literature about dialogue systems. So in 1997, uh, Esther Levin and uh, Roberto Pieraccini uh, in ASRU proposed the first paper about uh, dialogue, modeling a dialogue system as an MDP. 40, it, it was the, for the uh, ATIS system, so it was not air fares, but air routes. You, you, tr you try to find air routes uh, by interacting with the dialogue system. 411 states, four actions, and using this method, the Monte Carlo method, they needed 710,000 dialogues to converge. It's only four actions, see? Very small state space, four actions, 710,000. So, at that point, most of people just would just have said, well, that's not possible, just give up <laughs> reinforcement learning, don't do that, because collecting that amount of dialogues is just not possible. So what they did is actually simulating dialogues. They simulated the user, they built a user simulator with probabilities of answering, probabilities of noise, and things like, and things like that, so as to simulate this amount of dialogues and learn the optimal policy for this task. So that was almost 20 years ago. And it was, uh, uh, as I said, the Monte Carlo method. So Monte Carlo method is really the, it's the best you can do in terms of convergence. It will for sure converge to the best, to, to, to the real uh, value and the, the best policy. This is, you cannot, you mostly cannot do better in terms of convergence, but it's the worst in terms of uh, sample efficiency. You, you really need a lot of samples so as to be sure that you convert to the, to, to the to the right uh, value function. So actually, there is a compromise between the dynamic programming and Monte Carlo. Dynamic programming is cool because if you know everything, you, you get the, the, the optimal value function just by computation. It works perfect. Monte Carlo is cool because you don't need to know the, the transition uh, probabilities. While this uh, dynamic programming is not cool because you need to know the uh, transition probabilities. So we should try to mix both. The, and what is the, the idea for, for mixing Monte Carlo, which doesn't need uh, transition probabilities, but learns from samples? And dynamic programming that doesn't need sample, but you need the transition probabilities, and you have to know them by, in advance. The idea is that when you look at dynamic programming, why is it cool, it's because it's, it links the value function of the current state to the value function of the next state. So what's the point of, Mon Monte Carlo doesn't need, doesn't use that. It, the Monte Carlo method doesn't use the fact that you know that there is a link between the current value and the value of the next state. So we should actually try to introduce this link into Monte Carlo method so as to make them more efficient. And the idea is that is, done, is given by the principle of temporal differences uh, that has been proposed by Sutton in 88. So it's quite uh, old as well. The idea is that 
if you had, if you had a non-stochastic system, a very deterministic system, you interact with it, etc., the value function of a state is given by the sum of by this sum of rewards cumulated with discounted discounted with the, the gamma. And this is actually the current the, the the immediate reward plus the value function of the next reward. So the idea is to say that v should tend towards r plus gamma v of the next state. This is a target of v. So if v should tend towards that, v minus, minus this value should be zero. So we should uh, develop a method so that this minus this tends towards zero. And this minus this is called the uh, temporal difference, okay? So the idea is to update the value function, so to create an update rule that will make V of ST to tend towards this value. So this is actually a kind of uh, Vidrov uh, update or a stochastic gradient descent. You actually update your current value according to some uh, part, portion of the error you are making on this value. And the error you are making on this value is the difference between V and its target. So you make V tend towards this by using this update rule. So after each interaction you have with the system, you get a new reward and you update v according to this new reward and the, fun the value function of the state in which you ended up after having performed your action in state s. So you're in state s, you do an action, you are in state s plus one, you observe v of s plus one, your current evaluation of v of s, uh, st plus one, and you also get a reward, okay? So by using this update rule, you will tend toward the perfect evaluation of your current policy. It's not, not the optimal policy, but your current policy, okay? But of course, what you want is the best policy, not the current policy. You want to, turn, you, you, you want to go toward uh, the best policy. So you can actually do the same for Q, like for the Q value. So you, you, you update your, Q, the, your estimate of your Q value according to the action you took in, action, in state S. So you update it by using the same update rule so that this Q value will go towards this. And how do you learn the best policy? You actually choose your next action according to the policy you are, uh, according to the value function you are learning. So if if you, are, you have an action that is better, that there's a better uh, Q function than the one you are currently selecting according to your policy, then you, just, you should change your policy so as to uh, take the one that has the highest Q value. So the algorithm is, the algorithm is uh, an online algorithm. You learn online by interacting with the system. After each interaction, uh, well, at, at each state, you choose an action according to Q, for example, the maximum on A uh, of Q. So you take the maximum one. And this is the way you improve your policy. And then you evaluate your new choice by updating your current estimate of the Q value with this rule. So it's like policy iteration. So policy iteration was I evaluate my, my current policy and improve it evaluate again, improve it, evaluate again, improve it. Here, I actually do exactly the same, but I don't evaluate the whole policy everywhere. I just evaluate it at the state, I, in the, the state in which I am. I do one action, estimate what is the quality of this action, update the, the Q function, step to another state, and then choose the new action according to the, the value function. So it's like an asynchronous uh, policy iteration. I mean, it, by this I mean I don't evaluate the whole policy and I, I don't improve the whole policy. I just locally improve according to one sample the policy. 
And there is another, uh, another um, uh, update rule that is based not on the evaluation Bellman equation, but, also, but on the optimal Bellman equation, you know, with the max. And this actually, if you use, so you start from any uh, estimate of Q, you modify your, your current estimate according to this rule, which comes from the, the optimal Bellman equation, and this will tend toward learning the Q value of the best policy, of the optimal policy. So whatever you do, whatever the action you choose, if you update with this rule, so you can be totally random. That's, that's what I mean here. Uh, with, with Sarsa, that's the, uh, one thing I didn't say about Sarsa, it's called Sarsa because to learn to, the update rule needs S, A, R, S prime, I, A prime, Sarsa. So that's, uh, that's no. <laughs> it could be, but no. Change uh, to L, yeah, a, a, a leeward. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so if this, uh, you, ha you actually have to follow your, your uh, you have to update your current policy, you have to change your current policy so that it improves with time, with SARSA. While with Q-learning, you can be totally random. You do whatever you want with the system. You are totally random. If you use this update rule, you will, you will learn the optimal, func the optimal uh, value function. So once you are done, yeah, you, have, you have done a lot of uh, random things with your system, uh, you just uh, stop doing random things, and uh, then you use what you've learned, and what you've learned is actually the optimal policy. So uh, these two algorithms, uh, you can find them uh, back uh, to uh, 2002. Uh, I think the first uh, first use of SASA and Q-learning are in 2002, and it's been like it's been used like for the last 10 years. For the last 10 years, everybody used SARS and Q-learning and user simulation, actually. Including me, actually. Uh, but it's still not very efficient. You still need 100,000 dialogues or something. So, yeah, so-so. <laughs> so how, did, how do we tackle this data sparsity problem? We don't have that much dialogues. To learn from. We don't have that much time to learn from either. Actually, people, all people did uh, was, as I said first, using user modeling, user simulation. Back, back to 1997 is the first example of user simulation for reinforcement learning, also by uh, Roberto Pioracini and uh, Wieland Eckert here. Uh, so the idea is that you have a few amount of real interaction with real user and a spoken dialogue system. You try to learn a user model, a user simulation model. Then you generate fake dialogues. You record them or you learn online, whatever. But then you learn from fake dialogues. This has been what we've been doing for the last, between, uh, let's say, 2000 and 2010. Most of people just did that because we admitted that reinforcement learning was crap and that we, we, could not, we couldn't learn with less than uh, 100,000 dialogues. And actually, it's not true because during wh wh while we were applying this to dialogue system, people from machine learning uh, were still improving that, uh, reinforcement learning things because we were using uh, algorithms that, that, had, that were 30 years old and in the best case or even 50 or 60 years old in the other cases. So the other way to improve, to, to use dialogue system in a real uh, setting with, with, with a, a lower number of samples is to actually do value function approximation and learn from batch. You actually, this is like, what, what I mean is that we should cast this into some sample efficient learning. And what, what are the sample efficient, met, uh, what are the learning methods that we know to be uh, sample efficient, it, these are supervised learning methods. Supervised learning methods are very efficient, and so far the reinforcement learning algorithms we've seen are not uh, efficient enough. So we should combine, actually, uh, uh, reinforcement learning and uh, supervised methods. So, but it's still important that I've shown so far that 
the, we casted the problem of reinforcement learning into a function approximation. What we want now is a Q function. We, want, we don't want the policy. Well, we want the policy, of course, but we don't want to learn immediately the policy. What we want to learn is the Q function. So we can actually think about casting this learning into a regression problem, regressing the value function. Okay? We, have to, we will try to regress the value function so that we can generalize and apply very efficient uh, uh, supervised learning methods. Okay, so what is supervised learning after all? Supervised learning is you are given inputs and outputs, and you know that outputs are functions of inputs. And what you want is to learn this function or an approximation of this function so that in any, for any input, you can find what would be f of x. Okay, this is regression. You are given some x and y. You know that y is f of x, and you're trying to find f. Okay? And you usually do that uh, by minimizing a, con a cost function. And this cost function is often a quadratic cost function. You actually, you actually try to find f, an estimate of, x, of f of x that will minimize this kind of cost function. Okay? That's the different, yeah. So try to minimize the energy of the error. Uh, why can you, why don't we do that with value function? Q is the value function, and we want to regress Q. So why, why don't we do that immediately? So the input would be X, well, it would be the state for the value function, and for the Q function, it would be uh, S and A. Q, the Q is the function of S and A. So here, the input would be S A, and the output would be V or Q, okay? So why don't we do simple uh, uh, supervised learning? It's because we don't observe Q anywhere. Here, you have Y is F of X. So that means that you need samples of F. And in our case, we would need samples of V or samples of Q. But we don't have them anywhere in the state space. What we observe are rewards. So, but rewards are linked to the value functions through the Bellman operator. So we can actually use this trick to cast it into a, a, a reward, in, into a supervised learning method. So for example, we will say that Q is a parametric function, a linear parametric function, and we will try to find the parameters of this linear parametric function using some supervised learning. So the idea is that no, well, so, uh, yeah, and we have a way to project Q on the hypothesis space spanned by the uh, linear representation. So we need some uh, basis function. Those basis function uh, creates an hypothesis space, and we want to find the parameters that will project the Q function on the, on the hypothesis space, and we, we we actually say that we have that. We have a, a, a method that projects a function into the hypothesis space, uh, so it can be a least square or whatever. So what we want is actually to find this, but we don't do this. We never see this, actually. Q is never observed. You only observe rewards, okay? So there are different methods to do that. Uh, so. Let's do it anyway. So the idea is that, okay, we don't observe it, but let's derive the equations and see what happens. So we have, we want to minimize this, but we actually minimize this because it's according to the samples we have. We only have samples, uh, let's say that we have samples of the value function that we want to regress. And uh, we, uh, and we have the, the, the current estimate. This is what we search for. That's what we, we are supposed to observe. And let's do a stochastic uh, gradient descent on this. So stochastic gradient descent, you just derive, uh, you just update your parameters, your previous uh, uh, estimate of the parameters according to the derivative of this. And the derivative of this is given by this if it's a linear function, okay? But still we don't have this, okay? We don't have the target. We don't, we don't observe the value anywhere. So how do we do? We don't have V. How do we do? Well, we actually say this is actually linked 
to the estimate of the next value thanks to the, re the, the Bellman operator. So we replace this by this. The, the, the value of the state I tried to, to find is actually the immediate reward plus the value of the next state. Okay? So this is called bootstrapping. I used the current estimate as a target for the next estimate. So this is bootstrapping. Uh, and it actually gives this uh, update rule for the parameters. So that, this just means that you actually can cast reinforcement learning into uh, supervised learning, but you have to be very careful because what you try to target is not directly observable. So you should use the Bellman operator to find the target, and this is a way to do it. The problem with this way is that if your parameterization is not linear, for example, you use a neural network, this will not converge. Well, this can converge, but this is, uh, there is no guarantees that it will converge. With a linear representation, it will converge. But, uh, uh, yeah, it can. It, it can dive, it, it, but it, but it, so it also can converge. <laughs> so it doesn't. It, there, there is no, there is no easy way to prove that it will converge. Uh, and there are counterexamples that will show that it will diverge. And this has been, this has been applied for the first time in 2008, while it's been uh, proposed by Tesoro in uh, 1995. So the first time, uh, this is actually SARSA with value of a function approximation. If you look at this, you look at this equation and compare it to the SARSA equation, it's actually exactly the same if this is equal to one. So it's SARSA, it's SARSA with a function approximation and it's been used for the first time in 2008 on a very big uh, dialogue system, uh, 10 to the power of 87 states. But still, to learn, they, they still needed some, uh, some simulation after to, to improve. Okay, so there are other methods. Uh, actually, the method I just told you, try to minimize this distance, Q minus Q. The estimate of Q minus the real Q. This is the, the one that we, we tried now to, uh, to uh, minimize. What we can actually also minimize is this distance. The, the distance between Q and the Bellman operator applied to Q. You know that, uh, as I wrote here, you're supposed to have Q equal BQ. So you can try to minimize Q minus BQ. Okay? And so this is the uh, method that is called Bellman residual. So you try to minimize this distance, and you actually empirically make it with the samples you have. So you sum over the samples and you try to minimize this distance. And you can actually use the same idea of uh, using a stochastic gradient descent on this cost function now. So if you replace all this, we can replace the V by the, their uh, parametric representation. Okay, so this actually is uh, another way to minimize, uh, the, to, to cast uh, reinforcement learning into a, a into a supervised learning problem. Uh, the problem is, uh, there is another problem with reinforcement learning, which is that the samples are not independent. So the, when you do supervised learning, you usually uh, assume that all your samples are in, uh, independent and ident identically distributed. It's not the case with reinforcement learning, since the, next, the states you are observing are in a trajectory, because you are, they, they depend on the previous state. I did an action in a state, I end up in a new state. That means that there is a link between the, the current state and the next state. And if you minimize this value, this uh, cost function, you actually don't minimize the distance between V and TV because there is a variance terms arising here because of the square. So that actually can diverge as well. So what people use is the double, double sampling trick. So the double sampling trick says that you should start from S, do an action and see S, uh, the next uh, state. And actually you should come back to S, do another action, the, no, the same action, sorry, and then 
see another next state. So this, so that this part of the equation and this part of the equation are not correlated anymore. Okay, and the, there is a third way to do it, which is actually the one on, on which I will conclude. Uh, uh, is act, it's actually the fixed point. Um, so it's the projective fixed point uh, method. So I come back to my drawing here. So I said that we have a projection operator that that makes it possible to project any function onto the hypothesis space. So I could project either Q, either TQ. So TQ is the Q on which I had applied the Bellman operator, and this has to be projected again on the hypothesis, on the hypothesis space. So I can try to minimize this distance, this was the direct method. I can minimize this distance, which is the resi Bellman residual method. And I can also minimize this distance, which is the projected fixed fix point uh, method. And this actually uh, has been, so yeah, I don't really need to explain the, the equations, but uh, this has been applied recently to uh, 2011 to a uh, dialog system. So I, so to the, the system I told you about before, uh, about the, the finding three, finding a restaurant uh, using three different slots, two, two different information. So yeah, so you know, you have in mind a, a certain type of cuisine in a certain type of uh, location and uh, with a certain price range. So you have three uh, slots, but I, I replaced, uh, we replaced the, the value of the slot uh, from binary values. So it's not, I know, I don't know, but we replaced them by the confidence levels of the speech recognition. Speech recognition tells you I know with 60%, 70% or whatever, and this is a continuous value. And so we replaced those, the, the three slot values by three uh, confidence levels. Uh, so that makes a uh, state space which is three times continuous. So it's even more than 10 to the power of 87. It's three times continuous. And we have uh, uh, 13 actions. Uh, so you could ask for a slot, explicit confirm, implicit confirmation of slots. Implicit confirmation of a slot is like uh, if I tell you uh, in which area of the town do you want an Italian restaurant? And you say by the river, you implicitly confirm that you want an Italian restaurant. So it's implicit confirmation, it's a special type of actions which makes the dialogue more lateral. And then the reward was like, uh, you have a plus 25 if you uh, have an answer with a correct, with the, a correct slot, minus 25 if, the, if, if there is an incorrect slot in the answer, and uh, minus 300 if you have an empty slot in the answer. And we used actually, uh, Two algorithms, uh, two batch algorithms. Uh, so we started from an uncrafted policy and collected data from this uncrafted policy. And you see this is the reward you get by learning from samples. Of course, the uncrafted uh, policy doesn't learn anything. It stays with the same reward. And with 5,000 uh, 5, uh, samples, we actually got a, a policy which is quasi-optimal. And when I say 5,000 5, samples here, 5,000 sample is actually not 5,000 dialogues, but it's 5,000 turns of dialogues. So each dialogue was approximately five to six turns. So this makes 1,000 turns, 1,000 dialogues to learn an approximately uh, perfect policy. Perfect policy would be close to 60. This one was close to 50 with this kind of methods. So this means that by casting reinforcement learning into a, a supervised learning problem, we ended up with methods that could learn from a reasonable amount of dialogues. 1,000 dialogues is reasonable to collect. So that's, that's the idea. Then, of course, there, we, we also tried it on a more complicated domain, uh, LSPI. Well, I, I will not have time to talk about Q, uh, QTDQ, etc. but uh, LSPI, for example, here uh, performed uh, also very good. And LSPI is one of those methods I, I told you about with the Bellman residual, etc. 
So you see that you can learn from, this is, no, this is the number of dialogues. You can learn from a fairly reasonable amount of dialogues, a very good policy in uh, a complicated domain. So the, this domain is more complicated than the one before. So the one before was just three slots. This one I was talking about was just three slots. This one was uh, with 12 slots, uh, and it's the Cambridge system that Melissa will, will talk about later. So this has been uh, some recent results that shows that it's possible to scale up, it's possible to learn from a low, uh, small amount of dialogues. And this actually uh, helps, helps a lot. Well, it's, it's, uh, it gives good perspectives. Uh, yeah, just, just maybe one, one word about this uh, uh, still, because uh, I've, talked, I've talked a lot at the beginning about the, the fact that you shouldn't disturb the user, you shouldn't make some, uh, uh, you shouldn't, while you are learning, you still have to perform correctly with the user. And this is a very uh, also challenging problem uh, that we actually tried uh, to solve. The, 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 well, there are different ways. So uh, in, in Cambridge, they use uh, Gaussian processes. And uh, in my group, we used uh, the Kalman temporal differences. The idea of this is, again, to cast the problem of reinforcement learning into a supervised learning problem. But suppose that what you are looking for, the Q function that you are looking for, is a hidden variable of your problem. And you try to find it using uh, Bayesian filtering. You, you try to make a Bayesian update of your, uh, uh, of your parameters instead of a supervised learning, uh, in, instead of minimizing directly a cost function, you try to infer the parameters of your Q function uh, online uh, with a Bayesian method. And the good thing with Bayesian method is that it doesn't give you only the value function, but also some un the distribution over possible value functions. But, so that gives you some uncertainty about your estimate of the value function. And this uncertainty, you can use it not to disturb the user. You say, well, this outcome is quite uncertain. So don't, don't push it too much in this, uh, in this way because it might be very bad. But, well, it's quite uncertain. But in the, in the confidence interval, you have very bad things. So you, you will not go and use these actions. But you have other... Uh, parts of the state space where you are uncertain, but uh, it's kind of good. Uh, it, the, the confidence level, uh, the confidence intervals tells you, well, it should probably be good to try this uh, action. So you drive your uh, exploration of the possible policies according to un the uncertainty you have uh, upon the, uh, the, the, the Q function, the estimate of the, the, the Q function. So yeah, we've also there are different uh, there are different uh, methods to do that, but you you can actually see that uh, if you if you if you use this uncertainty, uh, so the red the red line here is uh, using uncertainty, and the green line is not using uncertainty, and you see that you are converging faster with a less with a lower variance if you use the uncertainty. So you you actually converge to a Good policy, faster, and with uh, without disturbing the the user. The disturbation of the user will lead to a greater variance in the reward that you that you get. Actually, okay. So I think we could actually stop here. Except that, yeah, what I yeah maybe just this. The what I didn't talk about was the the partial observability of the inputs. So, uh, and this will be the, the topic of the talk of Melissa this afternoon, but uh, maybe I can introduce some, some part of it. It's just that since uh, what you are trying to learn from are observations of what the user said, uh, these observations come out from speech recognition, natural language understanding systems, and these are error prone. You don't really, really see what the user said, not even what the user meant to say. <laughs> so actually you have uh, a partial observation of what of the state of, uh, on which you should rely to take your decisions, and uh, actually this uh, has been modeled uh, in the 70s as partially observable Markov decision process. So you are still Markov in the state, but you don't observe the state. You only have observations of partial observation of these states, and you are not Markov in the observations. So what what do you do? Because you have to take decision according to the observations and not according to the states that you don't observe. 
So there are very uh, nice, sophisticated uh, methods based on Bayesian updates that I, I just don't tell you about. But uh, you can actually cast the, the, this partially observable uh, Markov decision process in two MDPs if you replace the state by probabilities over space, over, over states. And that, that will be uh, uh, further explained later. But the probabilities over states, uh, it's what we call a belief state. A belief state is a probability over the, all the possible states. And this actually can, we can show that you can be Markov in belief states. And the belief state can be estimated from observation. And uh, yeah, you have to replace the transition between state by transition between observations and things like that. And uh, this has also been uh, used to model dialogues uh, in 2000. So in 2000, uh, there is a paper by Roy, Nicola Roy, uh, that uh, modeled the POM DPs as a, the MDP, the dialogue systems as a POM DP. But they, they actually use, a, a, like in dynamic programming, they, they learn the transition probabilities, they learn the observation probabilities, etc. And then they solve it uh, by using approximate solvers like uh, point-based value iteration. So it is based on, uh, on uh, dynamic programming for POM DPs. And then later, uh, there has been work done to estimate what is the, the belief state uh, by Jason Williams and Steve Young in uh, Cambridge, uh, to estimate the, the belief state and then be Markov again in the belief state and use reinforcement learning on the belief state. And this is uh, another way of modeling this. but. Again, you see that uh, POM DPs have been proposed in, uh, in the 70s and uh, in dialogue system. We actually use this since very recently. Okay, I, I just, I'll just uh, stop here and conclude. Uh, so uh, what is the take home message of my uh, talk? First thing is uh, read outside your field of area because as I said many times, all these algorithms were there for decades and we didn't use them because, uh, well, it was not our community and it was also not scalable, etc. But I mean, the, there, there are sources of inspirations everywhere, so you should read outside your, your, your field to get inspiration. And uh, also what I wanted to say is that now uh, we actually use data-driven methods for learning spoken dialogue system strategies because it deals with stochasticity, long-term behavior with uncertainty. So this is uh, okay. Uh, no, it's no scalable. So you can actually learn uh, from a reasonable amount of dialogues. Uh, and it's, this is actually uh, very important. It can also be, it can also learn from batch uh, data. So batch data means that you can use the logs of the systems that you already have to learn better policies for these systems. You can uh, improve online because it's an online method to, uh, by, by essence, uh, reinforcement learning is an online method. So you could use the, all these methods online to improve with real users. Uh, it actually requires less and less models uh, because you, you really uh, can learn a lot of things from data. And what I didn't uh, show is that it's uh, transfer transferable from task to task, but uh, actually I also worked on, on this. Uh. Okay, the, that's it. I didn't talk about the problem that uh, the reward function is not easy to find and things like that. So there are, there are many other problems uh, that uh, I, we can chat about if you, if you want at some point. But uh, yeah, thank you. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, dialogue system evaluation, I, I mean, the, the, the only way to evaluate one is to, to put it online and, test, and to test, uh, test it online. But usually what you, what you do is uh, you just set satisfaction surveys. And uh, you, you, put, you put the system online, you ask people whether they were happy with the system, whether they, they found the TTS good, uh, whether they obtained their information, the, the information they wanted, etc. So the, the, this is the best way to evaluate. Uh, and then people just made a logistic regression out, out of all these questions to predict what would be the user satisfaction on other tasks. 
or, or other dialogues, but uh, mainly it's based on surveys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from an engineering point of view, from technical point of view, how do you uh, evaluate the quality of the information you have? How do you keep it? Sometimes you get the information you have, and you have to reiterate it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so this kind of uh, all the time. But how the user? System well, the, the, the a static, uh, uh, rule based system, uh, I, actually, all these methods have been developed to make spoken dialogue system more robust to uncertainty about the inputs. So, a rule based system would probably uh, try to be robust by asking for confirmation a lot of time uh, during the, the dialogue because you're not sure about what has been said, etc. While these methods are keeping track of the uncertainty all, around, all the, uh, along the dialogue, and if at some point the uncertainty about what has been said is too high, it will ask for confirmation or ask for implicit confirmation. It will choose between all these natural ways to confirm, but only because it's the, 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 the estimate about what has been said is diverging from uh, well, not diverging, but you, you are getting more and more uncertain about what has been said so far. So, I mean, the, 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 it will actually adapt to uh, each dialogue, while a rule-based dialogue would not adapt. It will actually, most, most of the time, ask for confirm confirmation at the same point in the dialogues and things like that. So, it's very... Uh, it's more adaptive. It will, it, from from one experience to another, you probably will have different dialogues with a with a uh, from the P based or MDP based. So can we say user we realize it through more natural interaction? Yeah, it yeah, more natural, more efficient. Like like human human like. Human like. It's never yes. human like. It's <laughs> for for the moment. It's not human like. It's uh, yeah. it's still because it's not human like just because it's task. It's goal oriented. You are just talking about this, and uh, if you are going outside the domain, then it's uh, it's, uh, it's going bad. So, so it's not even like from that point of view, but from the efficiency. And the, if you stay in the domain, it's m much more natural to, to talk to a stochastic. It's natural, yeah, okay. it's uh, more That's more natural. natural. Yeah, it's more natural, but it's still because of uh, it's again, it's not really natural like human human because human would not make speech recognition errors. Uh, so it's it's it's. Uh, yeah, it's a more convenient way to talk to machines, but it's not human-like. Uh, <laughs> but this is actually the good, the good thing with reinforcement learning. It will learn this uh, by interaction. It will, if, if at some point, for example, in, if in the reward you say it should be a short dialogue, uh, you want the dialogues to be to be short, then it will accept more uncertainty to make it shorter. Uh, if you ex if you if you want longer, if you accept tolerate longer di longer dialogues, then it will probably try to confirm at some point because to to, to make it uh, to to be sure that uh, it got the the, the the right information. But it will learn it from from uh, from the rewards. So this is the good thing because in rule based, if you want to take into account the uncertainty in rule based system, then you need to define in advance what is the maximum uncertainty I want to be, to to accept. Over seventy percent, I say it's acceptable. Uh, below seventy percent, it's not acceptable. Then then you you will have to to define it by advance, in advance. Uh, but with this, it, it will learn uh, from the reward. Uh, when to confirm. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, and the, 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 that's a kind of an issue, actually, for the moment. You consider that all this, the, all, well, that's not true. There are some work uh, working on identifying the, the, the expertise of the user during the dialogue. 
but most of the work consider that there is an average user uh, that exists and, and that you learn from for this average user, which actually is not true. There is no average user. <laughs> so, uh, so there are two different uh, ways of handling this. Either you learn different policies for different types of users and you try to find out uh, to which category the user belongs uh, at the beginning of the dialogue so that you have the, the right policy. Or you have fast adaptation uh, algorithms that can uh, actually track the optimal solution for you. Uh, but then it works for longer dialogues. For example, for uh, tutoring dialogues, if you have a tutoring system that, you, that, that will try to teach you mathematics or physics or whatever, then you will probably interact with it for several days. And then it will, it, it will have time to track your, uh, your personal abilities to learn, etc because it's a long-term dialogue, but in short-term dialogue like this, then you have probably to, to identify at the beginning which type of, of user you have in front of, of the system.